Aloha and welcome to another episode of Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin, and we are joined today by the lovely Sarah Leone, founder of Aloha Resiliency and a legislative analyst at the Office of Representative Thielen. So yeah. thanks again for coming down today. It's my pleasure. And so today we're talking about land stewardship to lawmaking, cultivating mm -hmm. civic engagement. Yes. And so your diverse history, um, something I kind of wanted to start off with, how, what got you into this sort of world of, of civics, of community change, and, and what brought you to the islands? Yeah, well, um, it really all started uh, when I was in Chicago, living in Chicago. Um, I was working with a researcher there who was uh, researching uh, food deserts in Chicago. And they were exploring every single food outlet that there was in the food desert, whether it was a gas station or a grocery store. They were, they were ex examining what kind of food was, was there with the premise of before you can reach out to a community and tell them to eat better, you need to know what's available in their community. Um, so a food desert, to be clear, then, not a desert full of food, exactly. but more so the absence of alternatives to, say, just a, a convenience exactly. store. Uh, yeah, and source. there were some neighborhoods that you had to take two buses to get to the closest grocery store, for example. Um, so in that, in that research, I also participated in different community committees to try to improve the amount of healthy foods in the neighborhoods. And I was sitting in a committee in, this, in a predominantly African-American uh, neighborhood, and I saw this guy with dreads in the back, and I was like, what is this guy doing here? You know, what does this guy do? And then I went up and talked to him, and he's like, I'm growing food. And I was just like, where? And he's like, uh, here, like right around the corner from here, and, I, and my brain was like, "Doosh!" I was like, "This Food desert, no more." <laughs> it was just I saw it as dynamic wellness. It was a way mm. to bring intergenerational people to a safe space to have different inter types of interactions. It um, it was uh, raised the property value of the of the homes around it. Um, it directly provided healthy foods to people in that neighborhood. It was connecting people together. It was bringing neighbors together and reduced crimes in the neighborhood. So it was just this, uh, you know, never-ending effect of uh, positive change that it did to the neighborhood. Um, and so I was like, whoa, I need to learn everything I can learn about growing food. Um, and I ended up moving to Los Angeles the next year, which was like ding, 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 perfect growing season pretty much year round. Mm. Um, even in the winter, we can get away with a lot of things as well. So um, I was starting to eat up anything I could learn for free because I was broke per usual. And um, I was learning anything I could learn for free going to rose pruning classes, going to you know, nurseries that had a little event on whatever here and there, going to, you know, anything I could eat, get my hands on. Um, and I ended up uh, getting into the uh, Victory Garden class first that was uh, provided by the LA Master Gardeners, and then uh, going ahead and doing the uh, LA Master Gardener program. So Victory Gardens, <laughs> of course, then being sort of another I guess we could say model of dynamic, how would you phrase, dynamic wellness. Yeah. So operating as, as it seemed like you highlighted as your experience in Chicago was sort of the, the capacity of urban agriculture and urban gardening to provide a social safety net in terms of nutrition and other yeah. myriad benefits and victory gardens coming out of sort of the lean times during World War II. Exactly. And it was a specifically, uh, it's a program specific from the Los Angeles Master Gardeners that reach out to low-income communities to teach people how to grow their own food. In the modern day. At a low cost. Yeah. Yeah, in the modern day. Um, and I was lucky enough in Los Angeles, um, I also speak Spanish and mostly work with Spanish-speaking communities. It's helped me a lot, not here. But um, in Los Angeles, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, the group uh, Homeboy Industries that's there, which is the uh, largest gang intervention um, and rehabilitation program in the nation. Uh, we removed more tattoos for free than any other organization in the world. Wow. So you can imagine we get a lot of people with a nice, you know, F you or F the world across their forehead and they're like, why didn't I get a job? You know, so go figure. Um, so 
they were concentrating on um, providing a full list of uh, opportunities for people who are, were just recently released from prison or previously in gangs. So they had um, very technical things that might be court ordered, like anger management, uh, arts, drama, uh, domestic violence for men and women, Alcoholics Anonymous, you name it, those type of programming. But they also provided jobs for people. Um, and so they had this, this side shoot of social enterprises that included a bakery, solar panel, panel installations, they had wow. a restaurant, they had a screen printing business that did the best, it was the most successful. Um, so they had created an ecosystem of support services that exactly. had a, it sounds like an income generating model operating with a, essentially as a social enterprise exactly. to support uh, folks that are choosing to leave a, a dangerous lifestyle, to exactly. put it mildly. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so um, through the restaurant, they had a gardening program where they were growing foods within a mile radius of the restaurant. Mm. Um, and I was lucky, lucky enough to um, maintain those gardens. There was about six gardens. One was in a community garden, one was in you know, a school, one was right behind the restaurant. So a couple of them were in private homes. Um, and maintain them and also teach uh, people coming in the restaurant program how to grow food and nice. grow their own food. Yeah. So there's been a, a critique lodged against uh, urban agriculture from time to time, and I wanted to get, kind of get your opinion on this. Yeah. Um, often urban agriculture uh, acts as, as, as a, a fail-safe in a sense. So speaking about your experience in, in Chicago, to, to highlight that in particular, you're talking about people that are living in a food desert without access to basic needs, right? So whether right. that's uh, water shortages being cut off in you know, Detroit or whatnot, but that there are, aren't places where people can get healthy food. Right. And so urban agriculture arises as a mechanism by which people can subsist. Yes. Um, how does that um, balance with the, the often sort of a revolutionary, not to say revolutionary, but the, the, the sort of countercultural critique that is often with a lot of other, we could say more, um, middle class, upper middle class pushes towards urban agriculture more as a as a hobby per se than mm -hmm. than a subsistence level because it, it seems to me that there's often this loss of recognition of the utility as a social safety net, particularly when it's advocated by outside groups because yeah. then it, it effectively stands as a mechanism that further allows um, the lack of government or or even say business or just community support that allows for a consistent access of, of healthy foods. Yeah. So it seems to me like there's this sort of this, this kind of balance where it seems we have to figure out how do we, how do we support this program and, and highlight the myriad benefits, but also try and walk the line between sort of it being, as it was termed by one researcher, sort of radical or reformist or just essentially some neoliberal, you know, it's like cutting the loss of services then becomes acceptable because we have urban gardens or backyard uh. gardens. So it's kind of an interesting notion to, yeah. to consider. Um, I don't know if that's something that you guys came up with, but it's something that just in my work I've been kind of grappling yeah. with a lot, of trying to figure out how how you can afford or, or these opportunities can be crafted and offered in a way that allows for um, some of the more radical perspectives of you know community building and whatnot, um, yeah. and auto auto determination of of community goals, but also not trying to make it so that the the powers that be are off the hook for support. Sure. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And it, it sounds there's like... There's so many different angles you can use. There's a lot of different ways to, to sort of attack it. I know that locally you've been working on a few projects, um, one just down the street from where we are now, yeah. um, supporting some, some community agriculture. So how did you make that transition from working on the mainland in that to, to doing so here? Okay, so, um, yeah, I... That position ended there. I was looking for, for a new line of employment. I started working with a uh, landscaping company, so this kind of translates. That was um, uh, building gardens uh, that were either edible or native plant gardens. Um, and this was in, in California? I was also in California. And, uh, and then I also took the um, permaculture design course at that time as well. Always a good class to take. <laughs> With uh, Larry Santoyo. Um, so yeah, so here basically I found, I met somebody actually 
uh, at a wedding in Mexico, and he's like, I'm living in Hawaii. I was like, that's really cute. And then um, we, came, we came to visit each other, and I came out to Hawaii, and the first person I contacted was Mr. One Hunter. <laughs> and um, you took me around to uh, that wonderful farm. We were, we were kind of getting into uh, what's happening here. I also linked up with other uh, builders and creators in Hawaii, and I was like, hmm, there's stuff happening here, and there's potential. It's not at the same state in Los Angeles where you have a lot greater number of coalition people in a, a very diverse array of sustainability. You've mm -hmm. got the B anarchists, and you've got, and they're like a whole full group of people. And then you've got the people who are making like um, heirloom wheat and heirloom bread, and that's their thing. You know, there's a lot more subcategories with a greater number of people who are participating yeah. in it. Um, but I did think that Hawaii, I, first of all, I thought Hawaii would already be kind of on top of a lot of these things. It was like, oh, full growing season, yada, yada, yada. They must be on top of it. They're an island. Um, but I, I saw that there was still a lot to um, progress and that it was going to be different than the way it was being done in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, and I found it really interesting. And I felt like there was enough of a community support system to kind of start, get on the team and, and start moving and shaking. So. Have you noticed any differences in the, the sort of network uh, distributions or how people choose to connect or overlaps between sort of, I know you highlighted sort of the the, the bee anarchists and the, yeah. the whoever else is um, yeah. that, that I know that locally we have that there are sort of these these hooies of folks yeah. do, do our overlaps and our network um, interactions differ in any way or are they fairly similar or I'm just trying to think um, from an engagement standpoint yeah I think that it's fairly similar uh, I feel like still in Los Angeles you kind of have to be in the know to get into like those real like subgroups like be anarchist or things like that and I, and I think it's the same way here when there's like different subgroups on you know raising rabbits or hunters or fishers things mm -hmm. like that um, and there's still a lot left for me to explore here on the island but um, in general I felt like there's been enough going on mostly through the efforts of Matthew Lynch um, <laughs> Um, to connect people here and um, people are very open to talking to you and helping suggest people to connect you with and um, yeah I felt but I feel like um, you know there are a couple things that we could do to kind of boost the community and help bring more people in. Hmm. What do you see or what, what would those things look like? Um, well, probably similar to um, things that were happening uh, previously with Matthew Lynch, like the foodiology classes that he was having at uh, Fresh Cafe, or just kind of just kind of events that bring people of the same ideas together. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of happening out of Proto Hub. There's a lot happening out of Box Jelly. Different different groups. And these and, are both co-working spaces. And Transition spaces. Oahu. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we could always use more, more reasons to get together and have a couple drinks and daydream. As if we needed reasons for that. <laughs> um, so yeah. it sounds like from from your perspective that there's there's still an open niche for a, a greater density of of programming, of events, of opportunities for interaction. Sort of increasing the edge to use a yeah, and between jobs too. Professionals. Yeah, jobs as well. I think that it's really important that businesses, schools see the value of the types of work that we do. Um, and so, yeah, that's part of why I opened up the, this, uh, or started to work with the Emilani Organic Community Garden to start incorporating gardening to uh, the public. And All right. Like that. Well, we'll hear uh, a little bit more about your, your works with the garden and Aloha Resiliency when we come back from this short break. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii 
broadcast network. A Hanukkah ko means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at A Hanukkah ko. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. All right, aloha and welcome back to Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin. We are joined today still by the lovely Sarah Leone, founder of Aloha Resiliency and a legislative analyst in the office of Representative Thielen. So you were just telling us a bit about your transition from the mainland and your experiences there yeah. and kind of how you found the, the scene, if you will, uh, yeah. with those working towards sustainability. Yeah. So, um I'm a really outgoing person. I love meeting new people. I love connecting the dots. And I love, you know, I love it when people reach out to me and they're like, Sarah, what's going on with Sustainability Hawaii? And I can go like, boop, 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 and just place them places. Um, so I started, it, once I moved here, I started attending lots of events and started meeting and reaching out to a lot of people that I thought were doing really cool things in the community. Um, and I realized, like, wow, I'm starting to really pile up this whole track list of all these amazing people and businesses and organizations here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's not just me who would like to have this information. I'm sure more people would like to learn more about these things. So um, I started a blog, the blog Aloha Resiliency, kind of as a way for me to keep track of these businesses and places and uh, you know, state departments and city and county departments, but also as a way to be able to share all these resources with other people that are interested in similar things as me. Um, and, and that's, yeah. where can we find that, that resource? Uh, that's at aloharesiliency.com. Okay. And there's a little tab you can press that says resources. And it's a living list. I always um, love to accept, you know, if anybody has any tips for any cool places, I love to, for people to put it in the comments and I'll take a peek. And so this it. is a list of sites and organizations and exactly. people and... Yeah, yeah, exactly. That are, that are all working in some respect towards a right. more sustainable Hawaii. Right, and they're categorized under things like, um, you know, ocean and marine protection to uh, you know, online resources that you can go to, different videos you can watch, mm. to um, specific departments that you might want to talk to. So a veritable cornucopia of indefinite clicking. Yes. Good. Yes. Maximize the clicking. Maximize the clicking. Yeah. And so as, or we could say with Aloha Resiliency, um, mm -hmm. you, I, I remember as you were, uh, I would say, busy as a bee, sort of uh -huh. hopping, hopping around the island, and I would... And, yeah. I met you, we visited, and then I saw you then everywhere. It was yeah. great. Um, but that sort of then coalesced from, from this sort of diverse spreading yourself out to seeing everything you could into a few particular projects. So what yes. did those look like? Yeah, so um, I couldn't get enough of the Master Gardener program, so I did it again here in Oahu um, with the hopes to kind of have the similar uh, Victory Garden classes that we did had in Los Angeles that mm -hmm. reached out that had these low-income classes for learning how to grow um, and so I started teaching Victory Garden classes here um, I did two rounds one over the summer and one over in the fall um, and it was just great I just loved it um, but they are uh, it's a four-week 16-hour uh, course so four hours each day um, and we go from, you know, starting seeds, which I don't recommend, go buy a plant, I'm lazy, I don't like doing that. But anyways, starting seeds to, um, to harvesting seeds to, to uh, cooking with kind of the out-of-the-box foods or mm -hmm. thinking of different ways to use uh, different products from the garden. So, and then all the in-between, you know, maintenance, uh, 
integrative pest management, those type of things. So this happens on weekends? Yes, where? on Sundays, and this is at um, the Emilani Organic Community Garden at St. Andrew's Church, so downtown. Which you also had a hand in crafting. Yes, I was working with uh, Kathy Xian on that. And um, yeah, so we've been planting a bunch of goodies. We've got a native plant garden. We've got a whole bunch of edibles. It's completely open to the public. Please come. Um, and yeah, it's a great so that's little come respite. Come and harvest, come and plant. Come, come and harvest, come weed, come plant. Come weed, come, come weed. Come weed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, get a truckload of mulch, drop it off. So w would you be a good contact point for folks that are interested in getting involved with yeah, that? Yes, so you can right. reach me at sarah at aloharesiliency.com. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you that were involved the with the Victory Garden coursework and yeah. then the Emilani Organic Gardens. Yes. And now you've forged some other partnerships, right, that are yes. kind of taking, taking, broadening the scope yes. of so, Aloha Resiliency. Yeah. So when I was teaching these um, Victory Garden classes, Students would come up to me and be like, this is, this is great, but could we have like a more, when are you going to teach a more specific class on one topic? Or mm -hmm. could we have one class where all we do is build a worm bin and you teach us about the worm bin? Or could we have a class where all you talk about is, um, you know, which plants to plant to attract pollinators and uh, beneficial insects? So, I was, and, and then people were getting really into the cookings, cooking classes slash other uses you can do with products in the garden, which included a soap making class led by um, Kathy Xian of Pono Soap. Um, so you get dirty in the garden, make soap, clean yourself off. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so there was more inquiry about uh, kind of these different groups of classes. And, um, I thought, well, that's really an interesting idea, and that would probably be really beneficial if people are asking for this. And so um, I'm also really interested in wellness of the community and different aspects of organization and get gr bringing people together. Um, so I called upon um, my current partners at Aloha Resiliency, uh, um, Kahea Rivera, who's a Lomi Lomi practitioner and a health coach. And uh, Ray Mooney, who's a professional photographer and artist. And so we're also coming up with um, little mini classes. Maybe we'll start by putting them online on uh, different things that you can do for, from, from relaxation to urban garden stuff to uh, thinking of creative ways to work through modern problems. So. Um, we're really excited about that. We also have a product line of all natural products um, that you can find at Bodhi Cafe. Okay, and so Bodhi Cafe is where? Bodhi Cafe is on King Street, right next to Kakua Market, and across the street from Glazers. And it's open um, from uh, Tuesday to Saturday from 9 to 4 p.m. Okay, and people can show up there to find various products like these that you have? Yes, exactly. And so what, what are we looking at in this photo? Um, we've got some scrubs that we made for the holiday. These are totally, uh, totally natural. Two of them are sugar scrubs, so they're tasty, and you might want to eat them, but, you know, we don't want you to get sick. And so, then, <laughs> so, so no, I don't want no scrubs in my body. Yeah. yeah. On the body is fine. Yeah, on the body. It, well, it technically is edible and non-toxic, but... Um, so yeah, you can use those. And then we've got a salt scrub. Um, we've also got a lip balm that's also all natural using local honey, or it's not local honey, local um, honeycomb. And um, a couple of dishwashing detergents, or excuse me, laundry detergents hmm. out right now. And, so you and guys we're are developing new products to come out. Yeah. OK, so you've got this sort of list of products on the bill. Um, you've got this garden programming. Yeah. And it sounds like this, this sort of future of, of posting up a video series of trainings yes. that'll be exploring sort of personal wellness as well as community action through, through gardening. And whatnot. Yeah. I, to go back to personal wellness, I've also noticed between like activists and do makers and all of us that uh, a lot of times we're go, go, go so into everything that we forget about taking care of ourselves. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to 
stress how important it is and why it is something that um, we value as our company. So, so averting the uh, straight line towards activist burnout. Exactly. Way of it. Exactly. We we want this this movement to be sustainable too. If mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. I see. And so, I mean, have you had experience with that or seen that in, in folks, oh, partners yeah. that you're working with? Or Definitely. Are there critical diagnostic signs that we should be looking out for? Or I mean, uh, yeah, it's there's definitely a whole lot of this, like, volunteer burnout. And I really suggest sticking to, like, one to two things that you can really commit to and that are fun and sticking with that. And I know there's so many things that you can get into. There's so many issues. Um, actually, part of the reason why I like the organization IKEA is because they cover a lot of different issues. So they're kind of like my go-to organization to mm -hmm. look at different or, uh, issues and things. But um, what sort of work are they involved with, or what draws you to them beyond just their scope? Um, they're they're mostly involved in um, well labor labor rights, but also um, the environment, education, uh, higher education. Uh, arts, uh, wellness, health. So, and yeah, how are, how are they going the about game, addressing some of these things? Uh, they're they're having uh, community meetings that we've been a part of. Yes. Yeah. So Aloha Resiliency has been showing up in force to, and so these are just sort of community discussions to try and identify yeah. pathways forward, or yeah, is this exactly. more of a policy? Or exactly. Yeah, it's kind of to the... to forge uh, things forward, and also to find a connection between lots of organizations that are working towards the same goal. So hmm. you get to also meet other organizations that are working towards similar goals. So it sounds almost like a think tank and a meetup. Yeah, a almost. Bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little bit. And when, and when do those happen, or what's the what's a good way to uh, I don't know when the next one would be, but they all have a Facebook page that you can follow there. Okay, so their get stalking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so one, one of the things I know you had been working on for for quite a little bit, uh, was the Oahu Time Bank. Yes. Right? So tell me a little bit about what a time bank is, how that operates, um, where it's at, and where it could be. OK. Yeah. Um, so I first got involved with a time bank also in Los Angeles. A time bank is um, a mechanism to track different types of trades that are happening within the community. So the, these aren't direct trades. So it's similar to bartering, where um, you get a service for free, um, but it's not like bartering because it's a pay it forward system. So um, what happens is like Susie walks John's dog, John gets a haircut from Sally, Sally gets her uh, oil changed by Mark, Mark, you know, uh, tracks legislative bills for Marta, and it's just kind of this whole network and of people doing things again. for each other. Yeah. And um, the way that they're tracked is by the hour spent doing your service. Um, so if it took you an hour and a half to track your bills for Marta, then um, you would go into the time bank, record that you had put done an hour and a half of service for Marta. You get an hour and a half um, put into your bank, and she gets an hour and a half taken out of her bank. So this is a, we could say, a, a leveling um, alternative economy in a sense, yes, right? So all, all services are valued at the same rate? Yes. All, all goods, all And it depend on, depends on your time, your okay. time spent, yeah. And so where did this, you came up with this, or where did this no. come from, or is this a? So it's, uh, it's from Edgar Kahn. Um, he was a civil rights activist. He was a speechwriter for Robert Kennedy. He, um, and yeah, so this was kind of his brainchild to kind of level the playing field and to start valuing things that our economic system usually does not value. Hmm. Well, we'll come back in a little bit and hear more about our alternative economy operations and opportunities. Um, we'll take a quick break. Aloha, Yappers, and a happy new year. I'm your host, King Zilli. From inner city out to the platform and now on the Yap Show. It's a new year, and most would say a new beginning. So this is a call to action. As we promote tech, energy, diversification, and globalism, with Think Tech Hawaii, the Yap Show is all about advocacy for effective leadership, comprehensive youth policies, programs, and access to knowledge and information for upward social mobility. 
especially for the historically underprivileged youth. This means we'll be looking at young people making a difference in their community. Youth policies here in Hawaii, the country, and the world. We want to highlight youth programs that are meeting young people where they are, working together to accomplish a goal or tackle an issue while providing information and access to free educational content for anybody looking to learn on their own time, study for an exam, or simply refresh their memory. We do this by inviting everyday people like yourself, state policymakers, youth advocacy groups, youth programs, professionals, and so forth. But most importantly, we'll be partnering up with my new organization, CauseEffect.org. More information on CauseEffect as this website is currently in development in the hopes to feature courses, seminars, tutorials, and conducting surveys that will be featured on the show. As we leave behind 2014, I wish I could say we leave behind issues such as police brutality, youth violence, education, economic mobility, and so many other hot button topics that made 2014 a difficult year. So what does it mean for the new year? What does it mean for youth policy? What does it mean for the Hawaii as a whole? And most importantly, how does it affect you and your community? We want you to tune into the Yap Show at 3 p.m. Friday and find out. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin. We are joined today by Sarah Leone, the founder of Aloha Resiliency and a legislative analyst with the office of Representative Thielen. And so we were just uh, getting a little bit into time banking and hearing a little bit about the history of it. You said Genghis Khan founded this? Uh, it's actually Edgar Khan. Edgar Khan. Um, and so, yeah, so he, he had a heart, short, long story short, short, he had a heart attack and he's, and in the 80s and he felt like, he kind of had this um, thought like, wow, I'm in this position where I have all these people taking care of me. All these people um, are, I'm totally dependent on all these people. Um, and this feeling of like, uh, this is probably how a lot of throwaway people in our society are feeling. Like they feel trapped by, you know, any type of like government the sense things of that they're, yeah, this type of feeling where it's just kind of like, what, where can I, provide and how can we start providing for each other in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was kind of a way to um, track that progress between the community and also uh, have a way for people to reach out for neighborly things in a way that we have a lot less opportunities to, we, we don't get together anymore and have a ceremony and, you know, kill a goat altogether, like we used to <laughs> back in the day. Some, sometimes we do. <laughs> like, yeah. like in the 70s. I, I do that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's just less opportunity for people to gather together and get to know each other. Hmm. And so this is kind of a way for people to, um, to, to say, hey, I've got something to offer, and I also have some needs. So maybe this is a, way, a mechanism I can use to fulfill some of my needs, but also provide this whatever I wanted to offer to the community. So one of, one of the things, for example, like I've got people who come in and they're like, well, I'm an attorney and I hate being an attorney. You know, do I have to give legal advice? And it's like, no, that's not what it's about at all. It's about offering what you want to offer. It's not uh, like offer salsa lessons. So if I'm a, if I'm a gardener but I'd like to be a doctor, <laughs> um, how does that work? So uh, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, there, within reason. Then. It's got to be within reason, and it's got, and it's all that has to be kind of disclaimed mm -hmm. beforehand. So everybody writes a bio um, bef when they're part of a member, and you can uh, check all this out at oahu.timebanks.org. Um, but anyways, people create a profile, and that's where you could state something like, you know, I'm a licensed physician or whatever it is, but I'm getting really into chess, and I consider myself a high to intermediate chess player, and I'd love to have somebody to play chess with. So people could then hire you to beat them at chess. Exactly. That sounds great. Yeah. So it, seemed, it sounds to me like this time bank sort of fits into this, this suite of um, sort of 
stepping away from the anonymization of, of a lot of our commercial interactions or our commerce or our economy broadly. So there's things, you yes. know, like if we're talking about Airbnb or Craigslist or some of these, these mechanisms where it's, it's not that you're necessarily there to make best friends, right. but at least there, it's not the, the facelessness of just a, a checkout line that you're never going to return to or e-commerce or something like right. that. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and when I was doing it, well, some, and some examples of some exchanges that we've already had was somebody had their uh, porch fixed by a carpenter that was in our group. Uh, one of our members was pregnant at the time and had another member come over and help her organize her home. Um, so there, uh, there's been people who have cooked for each other, things like that. So, um, yeah. So it sounds to me, I mean, I kind of wonder, this, this brings it back around to what I was bringing up earlier about the, the sort of fail-safe mechanism that urban agriculture can provide. Yeah. It seems almost like that in some ways that this, this sense of loss that I feel like it maybe underpins some of at least what you were saying earlier right. in terms of our communal interaction or our communal connectivity, mm -hmm. that we're kind of making up for that in a sense by yeah. modifying what once were, or what were frequently, at least in some instances, economic interactions mm -hmm. and now making them slightly more social interactions. Right. So your painter may have been your neighbor and your best friend, but wasn't necessarily always the case. But this becomes a mechanism by which they can at least be somebody that you have some type of shared experience with through this alternative right. economy that's not just, you know, right. you, it's a little bit tougher to draw affinity just because you have the same bills in your pocket. Yeah. And uh, we do like to host uh, meetings, like different, not, well, we call them potlucks, where people can come and meet each other, and so it's kind of less of a stranger danger mm -hmm. factor that is added to it. Um, and so, yeah, and we're planning on hosting some other events. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because in other states, this is a worldwide thing. It's, I didn't invent it, it's nothing special. Um, it's totally worldwide, and um, other organizations do it differently. And actually, when mm -hmm. I first started the Oahu Time Bake, I got a phone call from um, the Department on Aging saying that they had just completed a feasibility study on time baking in, in Hawaii. Wow. <laughs> so um, there was a lot of interest uh, through the government, and, and that's very typical for other programs uh, throughout the states and, and parts of the world is that sometimes the government will actually pay for a time bank coordinator to be doing things. Hmm. And, and what I would like to see with the Oahu Time Bank is that we do get to a point where we could have a paid coordinator. It's kind of hard to figure out, like, uh, you know, doing all of the backstory for it and making sure that there's enough interaction and stuff between people. So ideally, there would be a paid coordinator for the position. And that's something the Department on Aging was, was looking at or at least considering? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So would that be something that might be advocated towards via legislative action? Um, probably not now. Um, it's pretty tight times for Hawaii right now, but mm -hmm. um, it may be in the future. But conceivably down the line, you could, that uh, there could this sort of legislative interaction could be some mechanism by which um, yeah. the time bank support system could come yeah. about. Yeah, most likely in local government. So County, county level. So with other, I mean, what, what do you see or with your work as a, as a legislative analyst, um, yes. kind of what does that entail? Uh, how did you get into it? And what do you, what are you fired up about for this session? Because yeah, I know you like getting get fired up. It. Yeah, let's get fired up. Okay. Um, so yeah, I started getting interested in the legislative process. It was really simple. I was working at a job that, uh, I could no longer afford to keep eating rice and beans at. And, um, and so I was also looking for a different type of job that uh, was full time and um, the, where I could continue my learning process and my learning curve mm -hmm. of you know, change making in, in spaces and in urban spaces. And um, I, I found the webpage, the legislative webpage, um, which is capital.hawaii.gov. And they were hiring for session staff. And so I was able to do that last year with um, a different office. And um, yeah, I was just really keen on learning kind of the ins and outs, um, 
I loved being around, you know, these power players and learning all the different organizations that are there at the legislature and know their legislatures. Um, learning about uh, the process of passing bills and also, um, you know, I like to f figure out ways to get constituents engaged in the legislative process. So I was especially excited about it because um, SB1 had just happened and there's now there's all this excitement around um, pesticides and GMO mm -hmm. that is bringing all this attention and energy to the Capitol. And so it's a really uh, exciting place to be. And yesterday was the opening. Yeah, yesterday was opening day, which was really... And there was quite a gala. Did you get to, yeah. to catch any of that? I imagine you probably probably were at work. So. Yeah, I missed um. I missed some of it, but there was a great cooey at the Capitol, people pounding Kahlo right there at the Capitol, which is always beautiful to watch. Um, and uh, lots of uh, committed uh, community members, too, out there. And it's just such great energy there. Yes. So what are, the, maybe you would say, the top three um, as we're as we're winding down here, what are the top sure. three things that you see as as having uh, opportunity, as having impact, and that that you think could actually make it through this yeah. session? Yeah, um, community organizing is key. Either getting on board with other or organizations that are doing legislative actions, mm -hmm. or um, just kind of staying tuned with um, what other people are pushing, because you do have strength in numbers. Number one, that's really important. Um, so there's things like surf rider. There's uh, lots of ways to get involved. Um, so partnership. That way. IKEA as well as one, as one example. Um, the next thing I would I would suggest for people who are interested is going to the public access room. It's on the fourth floor. Um, they always have their doors open with lots of plants around it. You can't miss it. And um, the great thing about the state of Hawaii is it actually has one of the best websites for tracking and measuring the, and bills that come up in the legislature. So um, everybody go watch the I'm Just a Bill video and learn how that works. Is that Schoolhouse Rock? Yeah, Schoolhouse Rock. Um, but uh, you can actually go in through the website, see, uh, get a list um, drawn up by measures per introducer. So maybe there's a certain uh, senator or, re or representative or your representative that you'd like to see what are they introducing you can go in there and track all those you can um, track per uh, caucus or groups in the in the house or senate so or both so you could be tracking all of the cakey caucus bills and seeing what's going to be in there to, to benefit the children you can go through to the uh, local food caucus um, bill and then track all of the local food caucus bills that are coming up. And those are some of the ones I'm most excited about. Um, so what, what are the, the, the key bills in that package? Or? Yeah, uh, the ones that I'm most excited about is uh, on-farm mentoring, uh, which is uh, introduced partly by the Hawaii Farmers Union United. Um, and that would allow farmers to uh, live on the land that they're, they're sowing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other would be um, legalizing industrial hemp for farmers to, to be able to grow it. And uh, the, another one would be um, giving permission to uh, restore Lo'i Kalo in uh, public conserved lands. Three magnificent things to work towards. Yeah, well, there's so much more to come. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And people can log on one more time at? At alaharesiliency.com. Aloha Resiliency, and then also to tracking for tracking bills? At uh, capital.hawaii.gov. All right. Well, so if you're interested in land stewardship or all the way up to lawmaking, Sarah Leone is a wonderful resource um, who's fortunately joined us in our community. Thank you for joining us today uh, for another episode of Sustainable Hawaii. We'll see you here next week. Aloha.